So you probably would have seen this picture. This is of Coonabarram Brand Public School and it is such a great picture of a regional school. It's the one that we're using for this year's Archives on Tool program. In the spirit of reconciliation, New South Wales State Archives acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. I acknowledge the Darug people whose land I'm speaking from. Hello Coonabarabran and Binaway. It's fabulous to be with you at least virtually and thank you so much for joining us from wherever you are. Particular welcome to the Coonabarabran History Group and the Coonabarabran Library and the people that are joining us from the library. So archives and tours are one of the ways that we engage across the state. Two of the other ways is through our regional network and touring exhibitions. This is the third year of Archives on Tour. We actually visited towns in the first year and maybe we will again one day. But this year, it's all about schools and teachers. We're virtually bringing you archives about schools and teachers of Coonabarabran and Binaway. We'll talk about the series of archives and how you can find them on our website and how to access the archives. There'll be time for questions. Out of the literally millions of archives, we'll pick just a few to show. We do have an Archives on Tour web page on our website and you can browse the digital versions of the archives we talk about at your own pace later and you'll see there's more there than I have time to talk about today. So do follow up and have a look at that. Where are we going? Well, today we're going to Coonabarabran. We've been to Ulladulla, heading later to West Wailong and to Cooma. Always mention that because I know not everyone who's in Coonabarabran or been away will have come from there. This is the site of the school paddock at Coonabarabran Public School in 1877. I wanted to talk first about two really great sources. The Department of Education website includes this absolutely fantastic source. You can search for a place name to see if there's ever a school there. And if there was a school, we can find out what sort of school it was. It explains all of the different types of schools and provides other background information about education. And of course, the other source is our website, New South Wales State Archives website, www.records.nsw.gov.au. All of the items you'll see on the web pages and in the PowerPoint slides are state archives, and we hold literally kilometres of archives. What I love about it is some of those state archives were created in the schools by the teachers. These are the series of archives we'll be looking at. There are other series so you could use to research schools and teachers, but basically the school files covering 1880 to 1976, so a huge slice of the state of New South Wales European history, the photographic collection, teachers' career cards covering 1908 to 1987, and the site register cards covering 1930 to 2000. There are a lot of schools now and there's been a lot more over time. So since 1848, there's been well over 7,000 New South Wales government schools. And there's been over 30 different types of schools. But more importantly, I think schools have often have a central place in towns, big or small. They reflect and are impacted by global events like wars and statewide events like drought and depression. Schools are involved in and create their own local events. They reflect their locations, coastal towns, daring towns, railway towns, mining towns, small towns and large towns. And of course, those towns that start small and end up really quite large. The school files were created by bringing together all of the correspondence about each school. The correspondence is from the teachers, the parents, the Education Department and District Officers, other government departments, local members of parliament, education ministers, local councils, parents and citizens groups and other local organisations. So the files from about 1876 through to about 1939 have got huge amounts of detailed information and particularly about teachers. From about 1940 through to 1979, don't contain the detailed information about teachers and also much more official in tone because as you'll see, the school files are often very unofficial in tone. 
These are the schools that we'll be talking about, Coonabarra Brand Public School, the Evening School, Binaway Public School and Coonabarra Brand High School. So most of these schools are still open. All of the school files have some similarity. They reflect their times, so the World Wars, but particularly World War I seems to be represented. Women having to resign if they marry in the 1930s, depressions, the expanding and decreasing populations, but they also reflect their town. The school files show that these schools are in farming areas and in the far west of the state. As Coonabarra Brand and Binaway grow in population and area, so does the need for schools and the size and type of schools. I've selected a very small quantity of papers about the Coonabarra Brand and Binaway schools. They've been digitised and put on the Coonabarra Brand archives on tour webpage. Now, the exciting thing for Binaway, and I don't know whether you know this, the Binaway school file has been digitised in full as part of our major digitisation project. So it's available on both the Archives on Tour School Files webpage and in Collection Search on the main web page. But enough of the intro, let's just talk about these schools and the great records that we hold about them. Coonabarra Barabran Public School commenced in 1870 under an earlier school system. And this is from the very earliest part of the school file. A new weather shed was proposed for construction. The specifications were very detailed, as is this meticulous drawing. You can see there's a division in the middle, and that was because boys were on one side and girls were on the other side. And on the right hand side, you can see a row of basins for washing hands after using the toilets. Now, by the end of this talk, you're going to think I'm obsessed with toilets, and that's because there's just such a theme throughout all school files. Small schools with a single teacher like Coonabarra Brand at this time seem to reflect the teacher's interests. You'll find things in every school that's different from every other school. Arthur Colwell, who was the teacher at the time, raised the money through subscription to have this gymnasium erected at the school. So you can see on the left, the letter where he's informing the Under Secretary of the Department of Public Instruction about his gymnasium and this great diagram of the gymnasium. So I hope the children of the school got a lot of use out of it. Teachers, among the many other duties, were required to carry out inventories regularly. This is an example from 1882 and provides an idea of the typical equipment used in schools. So scriptures, top the list, both Old Testament and New Testament. First book of lessons, so not applicable at this school. The second book, the sequel to number one, and so on. Australian class books, Australian reading books. Framed slates, they had 96 two dozen pencil cases, two boxes of slate pencils, and all of the other sorts of things that they needed to use. This, you will notice, is a marriage certificate. And this is the detail that is sometimes found in both the school files and in the teacher career cards. So the teacher, Albert Bridekirk, married in June 1887, and his wife entered onto duty as a sewing mistress a week later. Generally, it appears that the teachers had to furnish proof of their marriage, um, and that's recorded, as you'll see later. Not always, but you will sometimes see a copy of the marriage certificate included in it. The wife of the teacher often did take the role of the sewing mistress, particularly with it was where it was this sort of school with just the one teacher. In larger towns, they sometimes encourage them to employ someone from outside the family, which I think is probably a good idea. And it would have brought in a bit of additional income. Over time, there was a whole range of ways to become a teacher. Until 1905, most teachers in government schools were trained on the job as pupil teachers who usually began their four year course between the ages of 13 and 16. Imagine those poor 13 year olds. During school hours, the pupil teachers taught a class full time and each day out of school hours are instructed in teaching method and content by the head teacher. 
reports on pupil teachers like this one that I've just snipped parts out of are often found in the school files. Some of the areas to be reported on are surprising. So the teacher has to report on the person's physical health. So this is Wilhelmina Colley. Miss Colley has no physical infirmity and appears to be strong and healthy. And the conduct out of school. The moral character is excellent, being free from all injurious habits. A fair amount of leisure time is spent in study. I don't know if it's leisure time if you're studying, but she's fairly efficient and tries to assist in the various duties relating to the school. She gives her class regular instruction in music and in drill, but not in drawing because she hasn't been taught drawing. So quite a bit of detail about the person other than just what marks they got. All communities support their schools. I'm going to say this outright. Kuna Barabran has always excelled at this. And there are pages and pages and pages of representation about what they feel they need for their school. Helped a little bit later on in time when the local member was also the Minister of Education. But here we've got a newspaper article painting a really grim picture of the school. It's not only too small, but it's in such a wretched condition, so badly designed that a new one is, is an imperative necessary. They were at the school at the termination of the storm on Tuesday week and the whole building was flooded, rain having come through the roof like a sieve. On the right is the district inspector's thoughts. He didn't think it's so bad, but does admit the roof is very much out of repair. And what happened was somewhere in between, as you can imagine. New building work was approved with the possible conversion of the existing schoolroom into the teacher's residence. Teacher's residence were a really important part of the school and educational life. And most schools, particularly in towns that weren't sizable, would provide a teacher's residence. And you couldn't attract a married teacher if you didn't have a school residence and nearly everyone wanted a married teacher. So mentioned there was a short-lived evening school. So evening schools were a type of school established in 1818. And the idea was to provide elementary education for persons over 14 years of age who had previously received little to no education. They offered young men, women were allowed to enrol, but very few ever did, two hours of instruction, three nights a week. And I think that's why they were short-lived. They were usually conducted in local public school buildings by the headmaster or other teachers. They were basically poorly attended and rapidly replaced from 1911 with evening continuation schools. So the Coonabarra Brain Evening School commenced in 1889 with um, Morris Hennessy teaching and closed in 1891. What they often do leave you, this is part of the application for the Evening School, is a list of people who would attend and if they were underage, a signature of parents or guardians. So we've got James Lord, who's 16 and he's a watchmaker. Andrew Fraser, 19, a grocer. Patrick Gordon, 19, a boot maker. And so it goes on. So everything from bandmasters, composition, farmer, grocer, storekeeper, electric telegraph department. Nice little picture of a certain age group of local people in the town. The schools closed for the annual picnic. At least that was the plan. Because as you can see on the left, they're requesting the school and others in the vicinity to be allowed to close for the annual picnic. So this is across the whole state. Generally you got to close for your local show, but only one local show if there was an opportunity for a second one and for the annual picnic. But in the end, no other schools closed in consequence of the heavy rain. And so only Kunuk Barabran actually got their picnic day, which is a bit sad. Henry Fox was appointed to Kuna Barabran in January 1897, which is just before the teacher's career cut or before the teacher's career cut started. And in March 1897, he sent a list of repairs and improvements to the school residence marked A to Q. On the right, you can see A to E. The improvements included a new stove. He very helpfully included a page from the um, catalogue, the Lasseter's catalogue, to say this is the sort of stove that I want. So he wanted the whole of the outside of the residence and coat painted with three coats of best quality white lead. Paint the whole of the interior 
the IE walls, ceiling, sashes of the four rooms, passage and pantry with two coats of the same quality paint. But he also sent this as well as the picture of the stove. So he also attached the wallpaper samples that he wanted and where it would be used. I was amazed when I found them. 19th century wallpaper I've now discovered is quite rare and it's very unusual to find information about where it was to be used. So you can see the top left was going to be in the front room. The one below it would be in, I think it's basically going to be a spare room, it's not quite clear. The top right is going in a bedroom and in the best bedroom and I think Mrs Fox may have had some influence in this that would be the wallpaper chosen. So a wonderful little find again illustrating what you can find in a school file. Alas for Mr Fox only three items on his list were approved which was emptying the closets, reglazing the windows and pulling down and rebuilding the chimney. Now the chimney being functional would have been a very important thing to have. Henry Fox was someone who did really think about what he was doing. So he wrote in order to try and be granted an allowance to cover the high cost of living in Coonabarabran. And I wish we were, I was there and this was live because I'm sure you'd be able to give me some idea of whether that's still the case. He tried and failed, but what he did produce with this interesting comparison prices for standard products like tea, sugar and milk, so that Tea was two shillings a pound, a Kuna Brabran, and one and three in Sydney. Sugar, three and a half shillings a pound versus two and a half in Sydney, and so on. Milk, seven shillings a tin, or maybe it's chef, seven pence versus five and a half. And so he goes through a whole range of things. Drapery and boots, 50 to 150 percent higher. So we've now moved to 1900. John Broom was the teacher and he was working hard to try and keep or increase his staff. So he set out in very nice clear handwriting, um, request that the teaching staff of the school under my charge be increased by the appointment of a pupil teacher or an ex-pupil teacher. So that would be the next slightly more trained level. During the 15 months just past, the average attendance has increased from 39 Point five to 87.3. The total enrolment is 126 and the average attendance for the quarter just ended would have been considerably higher but for an epidemic of chicken pox. And then he's given a table showing the attendance quarter by quarter from June 1899 through to September 1900. So has climbed over that time I have little doubt that the average attendance will soon exceed 100. Nearly 10 years after Henry Fox raised the cost of living, the next teacher, Fred Putland, also set out the issues that led to the high costs. And this is where you'll occasionally get descriptions of the way the town was at the time. So the township of Coonabarabran is situated at a distance of 65 miles from the nearest railway stations, which are Gunnadar and Coonamble. Its distance from Sydney via Gunnadar is 360 miles, while the distance via Canamble is 443 miles. Even this does not convey the full idea of the isolation of the place. Owing to the nature of the roads, there is no team traffic from either Gunnadar or Canamble. Consequently, all goods have to be carted from Mudgee, a distance of 110 miles. The heavy freight charges add so much to the cost of the ordinary necessities of life that the spending power of money is considerably lessened. Some idea of the prices may be gained from the fact that the leading storekeeper charges nine shillings sixpence for an ordinary 70 pound bag of white sugar, which in Sydney costs about 13 shillings per bag. He got a little bit more sympathetic hearing. So the Department of Education applied to the Public Service Board who granted a living allowance to the teachers but not pupil teachers. I think the 13 to 6 year olds were probably considered to be still dependent on their parents. So the Public Service Board have approved the teacher of the public school at Coonabarabran, Mr Putland, being paid a living allowance on full rates. So quite a win for that time. This is Frederick Thomas Putland's teacher career card. 
This system of cards began around 1908 and continued until 1987. So basically a card for every teacher so they could track where they were going. He was employed before these cards started. So the numbers at the top left, just sort of sitting above classification, are the volume and page number on the teacher's rolls that cover 1869 to 1908. They've been digitised or are available through Ancestry um, and they're indexed as well if you're looking for teachers in that pre-1908 period. Fred Putnam was at Coonabarra Brand for three years, as you can see at the top, so the crossed out means that he's moved on. At some stage there was someone keeping these cards who crossed through the um, entry once they'd moved. So he moved from Coonabarra Brand to Port Kem uh, to Mount Kembla, which must have been quite a change. You can see a column under his date of birth that says class, and that's the class of the school. So Coonabarra Brown and Mount Kembla were the same class, they were a fourth class school. And these were also used to track some educational, Department of Education staff as well. So Frederick Putland became an inspector from April 1919, and that continues to be um, covered in these cards. To be honest, a lot of the school files are about closets or pans the most commonly used names for toilets in these files. It's easy to see why though. Over full smelly toilets are very undesirable and can also spread disease. So this is a plan for new closets from 1907. Among the other things that people from Coonabarra Brown wrote to the minister about was a male assistant teacher. So it was quite common that the head would be, so this is, where are we? In 1912, the head teacher, whether they were a headmaster or whether they were just the head teacher, would be male and there would be female assistants. So at this point, there'd been, I would say, a petition got up because there's two copies of it. The first petition is signed by 12 men and a second copy had about 20 signatures. So that the assistants are both unclassified females and although no complaint is preferred as their ability and earn it, earnestness as teachers, we feel that in our district, being so isolated, we should have a classified male assistant in our school, so as to give our children the best possible opportunity of receiving a thorough education. Just two of the many events that take place when people want schools to be involved. So you can see on the top, or on the left, and you get these sometimes nearly inexplicable telegrams because of course they didn't want to waste words. Chief Inspector Instruction Department, May school close, patriotic sports Wednesday next reply paid. So basically I think the idea was that this is during, just at the very beginning prior to the yeah of the war. So patriotic sports probably to raise money but also interest and enthusiasm. That was approved so you can see it it was sanctioned and then the lands department, I don't quite know why, tomorrow public holiday, pony races helping Belgians permit closing school reply immediately. Schools cannot be closed for races and I think it was the races as in pony races and the connotation of betting is the problem, not that of supporting Belgians. In 1916, the Shire President wanted the teacher to be given leave to assist with recruitment. As enlistment had already reduced the availability of teachers, this was not allowed. So Mr Howarth is a principal teacher of the fourth class. Please, I recommend that Mr Douglas inform that the shortage of teachers caused by enlistment is such that no teacher can be spared for other than active military service because teachers definitely went to war and that the Minister for Lands be similarly informed. Closing the school for half a day to Crown Queen allies as part of the Empire Day celebrations was permitted. Not encountered, and I think that's, that's what it does say, Crowning Queen Allies Day. I haven't troved that, but if you haven't looked at trove for some of these events, definitely worth a try. Change is really coming to Coonabarra Brand in 1920. 500 men are working on the Coonabarra Brand to Burren Junction railway line and their unions want a school. So this matter has absolutely been, already been reported upon by me. 
from a memo of March 20, it will be seen that a marquee is to be erected and a provisional school established. So it's great that the union was pursuing the fact they wanted education for the children and that it could be supplied. And Coonabarabran was getting a new school and a new school residence. But the typical Australian weather of drought and flood were demaying matters. So you can see that, and the headmaster had to purchase supplies of water in 1920. And similarly that the work on the new school was taking too much time because there was a drought, making it difficult for the contractor to obtain teamsters to draw timber. And then once of course the drought, drought breaks, then there are floodwaters and they also ruined the bricks which were being burnt for the school additions. The work on the school and the residents didn't go well and at a time when the railway construction meant many workers were coming to Coonabarabran, Mr Marshall, who was the head at the time, were in a difficult position. So in 1919, there was great difficulty in finding anywhere to stay. So the inspector saying passengers arriving by various trains walk the streets in search of accommodation, especially if they have families. So the recommendation is that Mr Marshall be allowed 50% of the cost of accommodation for Mrs Marshall and children elsewhere until the residence is ready. And that does seem to happen sometimes that the family will end up completely separate to their husband and father. That some concession be made to Mr Marshall to defray cost of board. I don't actually say they're going to help him find it. Mr Marshall's remove or Mr Marshall's removal and the appointment of a single man until the residence is built. Again, where the single man was going to be living but a less problematic issue, I guess. As I said earlier, every head teacher has different ideas. R. Burns wanted to introduce Latin. It wasn't approved. Having a language being taught in the super primary was one of the things that was very important. Um, and Latin is sometimes, but as they pointed out, if the teacher leaves who can teach Latin, then that makes it really difficult for the students. He also wanted a side drum because it was needed to give time for marching in the primary classes. And this request seemed to confound everyone. The inspector saying, I've never heard of one being supplied. And it's not a junior cadet matter, try the building branch. And building branch, I would imagine would have said, it really has nothing to do with us. The pupils of the Coonabarabran, Coonabarabran sorry, public school were involved in the unveiling of the Coonabarabran Soldiers Memorial in 1928. The usual thing is, and this is a snip from a memo, so the head teacher or headmaster would ask for permission for these sorts of things so that they could, he could take the school children to the unveiling of the Soldiers Memorial. Um, the date has only just been announced. So he would march the children from the school at 1.45 p.m. and assemble, this is the one with the drum, remember, at the memorial at about 1.55. The children will sing the recessional ode and Advance Australia Fair and according to the program also the um, national anthem during the proceedings. After the ceremony I'll march the children away and dismiss them. And then a included was the program for the unveiling. So the sort of thing which was replicated across probably every town in New South Wales and in most towns the children would have been involved. This is for you to decide. So in 1929 the Minister said the Wiston District Schools could have fly screens. Una Brown misses out. So obviously the Minister said let them have fly screens and the department said, let's work out how much that will cost. Um, the reports indicate that screens for the schools are not necessary. As to the cost of installing them is over 62 pounds, they might be admitted. Approval might have be given for the expenditure of 39 pounds to admit the screens to be provided for the residents by the painting and repairs staff. And at the same time, the Parents and Citizens Association writing to say 
um, how pleased they are that approval had been given for the erection of an ornamental fence. I think I would have asked for the fly screens rather than an ornamental fence. By the late 1920s, the site for a high school was being selected and reserved. And this is quite common that planning, you need to plan ahead. And frequently you'll find that the PNC has got their eye on that possibility. So the Chamber of Commerce is applying for the reservation of a suitable site for a high school is looking far into the future. The town is undoubtedly the centre of a large district of mixed wheat and sheep grazing properties. The town is about 2,000 feet above sea level and is just now attracting many farmers from the warmer districts to the west. It's over 100 miles by rail from Munty High School and over 80 miles by road from Dubbo. The demand for secondary education is just developing with the advent of many new families. So they're kind of saying this is this is the situation in the town now, but um, let's think about it. Here's a possible site, which is actually the site where the high school is, and let's think about getting it reserved. There were local inspectors, and it's really clear, or I feel it's really clear from their um, reports throughout and their dealings and their responses to questions that they did know how things were going in their schools. This is a typical visit to Coonabarron School, found the classes and pupils arranged as follows. So this is a different Mr Fox, there were two Mr Foxes. Um, Mr Oliver Fox had the 9th, 8th and 7th grade, Miss Donnelly had the 6th, 5th, 4th, Oh, the sixth and the sixth and the fifth, Miss McPherson had the fourth and the third, and Miss McEwen had the first and the seconds. Um, he thinks that the the arrangement is not the best, and some relief could have been afforded the weaker teachers had the headmaster taken sixth class in addition to the super primary, which is basically the classes above year six. The arrangement would still leave the rooms overcrowded and the classes too large for efficient teaching. And I would recommend that a teacher be sent to take Miss Burke's place as soon as possible. So they did have another teacher who's been lost. Um, the same story. The picnic day has been rained out. Maybe they needed to change it to a different time of year. So this is 1933. And again, in talking about what day they're going to move it to, there's a little bit of this is the way things are happening in the town at the time. So it's been rained out um, and going to be moved to Wednesday the 8th of 18th of October or in the event of rain to the 25th of October. The PNC had arranged the functions for the day uh, to be held on the eight hour public holiday. So now they're going to um, move it. Saturday is impracticable as that is the late shopping day and all business people are vitally interested in the picnic. So as there's no other public holiday takes place this year, they're going to move it. They've been allowed to hold the school picnic on a weekday, which is great. This is from 1936, where presumably the cinema has come to Coonabarra Brain. So your application for permission for pupils to attend the matinee screening of A Tale of Two Cities is approved. Um, in time, in view of the time occupied in screening a tale of two cities, a supporting film worth an Australian character may be omitted from the program. And the last item on the program, subtitled World of Sport, is considered unsuitable for pupils and arrangements should be made for it to be omitted. And I thought, well, what's wrong with the world of sport? Well, it's it's a boxing match, and I can sort of see why that may well be the the case. This is the top of a petition that was signed after a public meeting in Coonabarabran in March 1937 and it pretty much changed the direction of where the Coonabarabran public school would go. So there'd been a lot of discussion about improving, growing, developing the school and where it should happen and whether it should stay on the site that it was on closer into town. Public meeting, 
and they decided that given it had been delayed, that the site of the school be moved to land in John Street opposite the showground and that the proposed new buildings be erected there on forthwith. So this land in John Street was the land that was in reserve for the high school. Changing the site of the new school should not cause undue delay in the erection of the proposed new buildings and that the meeting cannot emphasise too strongly the urgency of as little delay as possible. Um, that owing to the very unsatisfactory nature of the accommodation existing for the infant classes, the parents declare their intention to refuse to send their children to school during the winter months. It was a common thing for schools to outgrow their sites and their classrooms and to end up being taught all over the place. So as early as the 1920s, the Progress Association were requesting a district school. Wasn't approved. By 1937, not only was a super primary going to be built, but it was going to be built on that new site on John Street. So a district school was, or super primary was basically those that provided primary and post-primary education. In this part of a letter, Basically, they've set out everything that needs to be included, including an assembly hall to accommodate 400 pupils. There was a lot of discussion about whether or not that could be afforded, but in the end, it was delivered. So this is proposed in 1937. It's changed as estimates were produced and as the Progress Association and others wrote to the Minister. So the present enrolment at the school is 354. They wanted to allow for additional pupils, naturally and sets out again in more detail. So four three-size classrooms for the infants, four full-size classrooms for the primary, four classrooms, particularly focused on different things like sewing, science and manual training. Lots of detail and making sure that the minister was never in any doubt about what they wanted. This is part of the headmaster's notes in 1937. There is more detail and his map on the web page. So basically what he said is that he's added some markings to the lithograph, which give a good idea of the residential area and the comparative accessibility of the two sites. So the present site and the proposed site, which was the John Street site. This plan of the town is four years old. Since then, the residential portion has expanded in an easterly direction, covering the area between I think it's Casillas and Edward Streets, shaded in pencil on the map. This area is now built out, built on, and the tendency of the town is to expand on this in this direction, owing to the nature of the country. Very swampy ground, obviously swampy ground and steep rocky hills. It is not likely that the town will expand towards the north and west, and the hills are steep and rocky. So I'm wondering, was he right about how the town would expand? Into the 30s, Coonan Barabran School's growing and in the process outgrowing its buildings. Classes are being held in the showground. Chamber of Commerce is fair because while they complain about a teacher not being replaced, they compliment the minister for the new school. So on the right, they're writing to say that you might kindly this matter your early and favourable consideration for the appointment of another teacher. We cannot allow this opportunity of passing without extending our, your good self our hearty congratulations in finalising the matter of a new school for this town. This led ahead from the 1930s and there's a request for leave of absence as a teacher was exhausted from helping rescue a person while climbing. It's the first reference I really came across about the Warren Bungles, just kind of illustrating that really multi-dimensional nature of um, your town. There's a whole packet of plans of the new school to be built. These are just a couple of extracts from just one of the plans. So the site plan, where the buildings are going to go, and then the south elevation. So turning now to Binaway, naturally in getting a high school for Coonagap Barabran, one of the things they did was to talk to both Binaway and Baradine about getting endorsement from the PNCs there that a high school was needed. Um, Binaway took very much an attitude of just as long as it 
doesn't impact on our school. The SNP labelled Binaway is from a Binaway PNC letter from 1961. Considers that Binaway has prospects of a steadily expanding rural future and the following evidence points to this trend. While a few years ago Binaway was universally looked upon as a railway town, school figures now show that only 20% of the children come from railway homes, 40% from rural homes and 40% come from homes of workers engaged in other occupations. So kind of a real shift in the sorts of things. School was classed as a second class school from the 1st of January 1960. Um, yet the average attendance at the end of the first term was 240, so well and truly above what they needed to be a second class school. And achieved despite the fact that several railway families were removed and replaced by single men, perhaps in preparation for the conversion to diesel trains. Headmaster uh, Principal Clutterbuck's 1961 memo that three married teachers were appointed to the staff and basically where on earth they're going to find them somewhere to stay is the whole question. They've got a house for four pounds per week for the deputy principal, another house for which the rent is six pounds per week and been taken by the math science teacher and the English and history master has now made arrangements to have a house built and then his wife and family will transfer to Coonabarabran at the end of this term. Gives you again that idea the other one on the bottom left is some statistics in support of the proposal which would be for the high school. Basically the growth, the primary department has grown from five to seven classes, infants and primary are estimated to have bigger enrolments next year, secondary department enrolment has increased by 40, courses including a language attack taken to the leaving certificate standard, understand that the high schools have been created with less than 200 pupils. It's always important to know what else is happening in other towns. It's expected completion of a town sewerage system within two years and a greatly augmented water supply. The council is becoming increasingly tourist conscious and there is no doubt that the proximity of the Warren Bungle National Park to which a road of access is now being constructed will all have pro prolific effect on the growth of the town. And there's a later letter from the Coonabarra Brand PNC which mentions the $12 million Siding Springs project which was also, there's a whole file which pretty much exists, consists of letters. So in 1968, all of these people wrote to the minister in support of a new high school. Coonabarra Brand Public School PNC, Coonabarra Brand High School PNC because they were on the same, basically part of the primary school just being taught separately. The Anglican Parish, the Coonabarra Brand Rifle Club, Anglican Women of Australia, Rotary Club, APEC Club, the Shire Council, three separate parents who said they'd gone to an education week thing and said, my goodness me, this is overcrowded. Returns, Sailors, Soldiers and Airmen's League, Parents and Friends Association, the Bowling Club and the local member of parliament. I literally pictured someone probably from the PNC rounding up anyone they could find on the streets of Carrot and Barabran and getting them to write. But I mean, good on them. It worked. So now we arrive in Binaway. So when the question of a school for Binaway was first raised, it was in relation to a provisional school. And in 1877, the inspector didn't think Binaway was quite ready or as he described it as quite ripe for that school. These are extracts from the application for a provisional school. So the position of the school is about three miles below Binaway and on the right bank of the Castlereagh River. There is a not terribly detailed sketch of the school. I can see there's a chimney at one end and there are doors and windows. The number of children, so 17 boys and 28 girls, 41 of whom are Church of England and four are Roman Catholic and then the inspector's report. It's a small settlement on the road from Mundoran to Coonabarabran from each of which is about 30 miles distance. So, you know, it definitely needs a separate school. Three in bigger towns, three miles is generally the distance. The information supplied as to the distance of other schools and the number of children in the locality is correct. The promoters are suitable persons to act as members of the lo a local board. A provisional school is the most suitable to start with, although there are sufficient children in the neighbourhood to warrant the establishment of a public school. By 1878, there was a location for the school. 
seen in this great little sketch map, the Castlereagh River and the Arpendil Creek and a teacher from England. So up there on the top left, Harriet Townley, single, she's 22. She was born in West Haddon, Northampton, England. She's Baptist and she had completed some pupil training in England. The school opened a few days late due to the weather and the flooded Castle Ray River. So Harriet Townley, she's only 22, but she seemed to be quite a competent person. Found it impossible to open the school under my charge sooner than Monday. Castle Ray River being too deep to cross, I could not collect my scholars, the majority of whom live on the opposite side of it. Those who live on the school site couldn't attend at the old schoolhouse, it being very open and airy and the weather excessively wet and cold. It was all changed in 1881. It's been away became a public school, as you can see by the provisional crossed out, and it's now a public school. Miss Townley became Mrs. Sinclair. There was some confusion about who suddenly was this Mrs. Sinclair writing letters to people. I have the honour to inform you that I was married at Orange on the 5th of January 1881. Herewith is transmitted to you a copy of my marriage certificate. And in her description of the school, describes it as plain but substantial. By 1899, there was a proposal to move the school from its location to a site beside the public house. People disliked the idea because it was further away and besides, it was going to be beside a public house. The school was duly moved, so this sketch plan from 1889, the public school is on the far right and the site they're going to move to, I think where that cross is, because John McWhirter's property, which was the hotel and store is where they were going to move. And then they've scattered with crosses the names of the various members' families. And what this, um, map makes clear, which is not covered anywhere else, it will be on the side of the Castle Ray River, where it appears that most of the families that attend. So this is all about the sorts of things that fill teachers' time other than teaching. So marking Arbor Day, which was a day started in the 1880s to encourage people to plant trees and was broadly, you can see it's that impact across um, the schooling system, something is usually going on. So here it's um, the teacher Thomas Tarrant discussing carriage for trees for Arbor Day and who's going to pay and also writing about repairs needed to the school. It was so bad that the rain came in through the walls and the broken windows. That the spaces or cracks between the slabs forming the walls to the school may be filleted or battened over as it is impossible any records such as programs or lessons, timetables and the various notifications from the department can be preserved safely from the rain which beats in it every crack. The storm on Sunday last completely spoiled my newly prepared program of lessons. Here are some great which plans of the site from 1885 which Thomas Tarrant prepared. So A is in the centre is the public school, B is the existing water closets, C is the hotel, D is the new proposed site of the water closets, um, the new veranda and so on and so forth, the government reserve and the Castlereagh River always present in discussions about the school up in a way. And then he's also done a plan of the present school building and the proposed new extension. Various improvements were suggested by Mr. Tarrant in 1900. So new seating on the veranda in red, in that nice little plan of what is it, again, another really classic school building. Oh, the new school building should be the same 12 foot as the present, it says ample accommodation, as there's not ample accommodation. Population is likely to increase and should a school be established at Rappendales, I believe the attendance will be well maintained at Binaway as Deep Creek separate the two places. 
Thomas Tarrant taught at Binaway for nearly 20 years. He was never well, and while, at Bin, while Binaway provided a drier climate than the Richmond River area that he'd actually asked to be moved from, it was not as cool a climate as he designed. Um, so on the left is a letter from the inspector saying, I've just secured a private communication covering the enclosed certificate from the wife of Mr Tarrant Teacher at Binaway, stating that her husband has been a patient at the Coonabarra Bran Hospital since the 3rd of October. And a very, he's a very delicate man and is therefore likely to be absent from duty for a considerable period of time. This school is situated 20 miles from the nearest medical man. A very common theme through all of these rural schools that I've been talking about. Um, on a previous occasion, I strongly recommended his removal to a cooler climate on account of his delicate health and length of service in the present post. And he's saying, do that right now and provide an immediate appointment. And then you can see in pencil on this that Mr Tarrant died on the 9th of October, 1904. John Muller replaced Thomas Tarrant in 1905. He was a late arriving as his eldest daughter had just died and two other children were very sick. Um, and that's in the underlined passages. It was utterly impossible under existing circumstances for me to take charge earlier as my son was at death's door after a prolonged illness and the medical attendant forbade that the child above uh, child should be removed and also advised me not to leave him in the pre in this in his precarious condition and then on the right hand side uh, John Mueller has listed all of the expenses that he's had in moving to Binaway from Wyaldra a distance of 82 miles but as you'll see noted on the first page, applied for this school and was not therefore uh, entitled to expenses. I know that it's partly my, you know, COVID impacted brain, but the number of epidemics that seem to have happened during this time period is amazing. And teachers had to deal with them and to know what was going on in their towns. So in 1907, Mr. Mueller informed me by telegram that there were no there was no attendance at his school and I instructed him to report formally in writing. I recommend that the closing been away public from the 28th of October to the 15th of November inclusive is sanctioned, which was basically for uh, due to influenza. And then in 1910, um, reporting on the diphtheria epidemic and that there are children one was very bad, laid up for about a week, but is recovering. The original patient is yet in um, Kula Hospital. A range of things that's going on again in a school. So from uh, the top left in 1911, there's another change of teacher. The wife and two children, so they arrived by rail from Hexham to Sydney plus incidentals while the teacher rode his bicycle from Johnson Creek to Dungog and then went from Dungong to Sydney. After, and this is Cecil Hamilton, and after he arrived in 1912, begged to enclose him with a list of repairs required and attended for the completion of the same. The fireplace is at present unusable and the boys closet especially needs immediate attention, there being no urinal. The seat also is broken and is too high for the use of the little ones. And then in 1913, various items were required for Binaway Public School, cast iron painted bath, a beacon light stove and pipe, one Boston shower, I don't know what a Boston shower is, four carpenters tank strainers. A new resident was finally erected in 1913. This was the first time there had been a um, owned by the department residence. Part of the reason for doing so was the changes coming to the school. So there's a plan for where the resident would be in relation to the school and the rest of the parts of the town set, the hotel down in the bottom left and the mechanics hall in the top left. 
Binaway is situated on the Castlereagh River between Coonabarabran and Mundowan and the line under construction between Dunidu and Coonabarabran passes through it. It will be a railway township and it is it is an old centre in what should be in the future an important agricultural and pastoral settlement. So again looking to the future when thinking about what sort of infrastructure was needed in the schools. So this is Cecil Hamilton who cycled to Binaway and actually when his mother died during his time at Binaway school he cycled there and back to um, attend the funeral. So again you can see the numbers in the top left meaning that he was employed before 1908. He was born in 1877. Um, he had been at Johnson's Creek before moving on to Binaway in 1912 and then really quite unusually he's at Binaway until he moved to Bermagui in 1922. He retired in 1941. On the back you'll find a range of things. Sometimes as in this case in 1910 he was in trouble about his teaching. Serious action threatened and less better results are obtained at next inspection. Whereas the action under Regulation 41, which sounds terribly serious, basically just means that they would keep them on for an extra year after the usual retirement age. Leave of absence for those time periods were not counted towards increment, which I'd say was leave without pay. Three different pictures of what was happening in Binaway due to outside events. On the left, um, the teacher Cecil Hamilton is applying for leave of absence from sewing duties for his wife, going to visit a ill sister but also desiring to see her brothers in Newcastle camp who are leaving for the front in a few weeks. Deliveries are held up for the new building in Binaway due to the 1917 strike which was a statewide strike and it meant quite difficult to get things around the state. And then the fact also in 1917 that the original contract expired in March and an extension was granted until May. He's been unable to complete. Labour troubles are severe in these parts. Men can make 10 to 12 pounds a week rabbit catching and consequently these alluring prospects make it hard to procure labour on works. I wondered whether the rabbit catching was particularly lucrative, was it for army hats? The railway coming was important to the town even while it was being built but there was a note of caution about whether enrolments would continue to grow. Despite that there was a school approved to suit 88 pupils. Um, the Dubbo to Werris Creek line will run from Binaway to Werris Creek and this section is to be built shortly. Binaway is likely to be the only centre of any importance between Merrygowan and Coonabarabran. It is about 30 miles from the former and 22 from the latter. Some of the surrounding land is fair wheat country. Of the opinion that the Binaway school will continue to average over 50 but is not likely to exceed that number very much for some years to come. That was a little bit wrong. Present building could be utilised for some time. And then as with many places across the state, a roller on a, was um, created for the people that had served or people that had died in the First World War. And in this case they decided that the school was the most suitable place to put that. It's quite early because it's in November 1918 and that was agreed by the department and it was erected in the school. Um, contain the names of all of the men who were listed from the Binaway district including a number of ex-pupils. By 1923, remember it's not going to grow above 88, there was 150 pupils wedged into the room designed for 88. In 1924 the then head rented an old hall as the marquee which was the standby to give you extra space was just too cold. So here is a slightly dark but a plan of some proposed additions where they would add basically another part to the L of the building. The next file that I looked at about Binaway was literally had about 50 pages about closets and then about 50 pages about fences. 
So sometimes they do start to become very much focused on building matters. Staffing was an issue in the 1920s. So this is a Binaway Progress Association because they know how to deal with um, their local member as well. So in 1928, please make immediate inquiries through Minister Education, who would also have been their local minister, I suspect, why Binaway school staff depleted to headmaster one assistant since holidays. Headmaster only 50% efficient owing to burning incident. There's nothing else about that. Also, why inspection vis inspector visited school and left same in such condition? Matter considered serious and disgraceful by parents in view approach of important examinations. 170 pupils average attending. This is now the 20s and a memorial hall has been erected in Binaway, controlled by an efficient committee. That committee now desire that the honour roll should be handed over to be placed in the memorial hall. I'm quite in accord with that request and recommend that the wishes of the committee be acceded to. And so naturally that was done. These items from the 1930s show the school and teacher in action. So on the left, organising agricultural education, even if it's only part time, and on the right, explaining the 50% pass rate at the primary final examination, which is quite a serious matter. It had to be taught in conjunction with the big super primary group comprising first, second and third year. Under existing conditions, the difficulties in the way of raising the standard for weak class are almost insuperable. Definitely weak, particularly in arithmetic. Other difficulties arising from environmental conditions. This is a railway centre and in consequence, there is a shifting population and a sequence of railway holidays or resulting in breaks in schoolwork. And then there are some special cases. If you're interested in schools other than Coonabrara Rand and Binaway, how can you find them? Go to our website, records.nsw.gov.au and you can either search for the online indexes and there's a link in the quick links box on the home page, but you can also search in collection search, just type in the name of the town and the word school. Site registers cards were used to manage the sites owned by the Department of Education. They record details of school sites purchased and subsequently disposed of. And as you will have seen through what we've been looking at, a site may take time to acquire and not need to be used immediately. Some sites are required and are never needed. This is in the site card, which is on the archives on tour, Coonabarra Brand page is for Coonabarra Brand and basically shows all of the sites. So the one on the right is the one where the schools are now and the one on in the middle, I think is where the schools were. I'm not sure that the one on the left was ever used. To find them, they're not digitised, type in the series number NRS 983988 and the name of the town or site register and the name of the town. The photographic collection is quite unusual for our holdings. It was collected by the History Unit of the Department of School Education from around 1963 to 1991 when they were preparing school histories, doing research and give or giving presentations. Many of the photographs are not official photographs and they vary in subject, titling and image quality. There are some schools where there are no photographs. So for Coonabarabran and Barradine, there are just some and some you've already seen. This is Coonabarabran. I think it's an absolute classic school photo. You assemble the entire school in front of the schoolhouse. I think this is the same one probably extended as in the one on the front page, but from a different angle. Any tips anyone has on dates would be great. Most of these are undated. And again, this is in a way, I don't think it's the whole school. It's purporting to be the 1920s. And there's certainly some amazing hats in that shop. All of the photographs are digitized with the exception of a few um, of the more recent images, which are only just starting to go up, go to our website, type in photographic collection and the name, or type in the series number NRS 15051 and the town name. 
there were 39 in 1851 and by 2015 there were over 54,000 teachers in New South Wales government schools. They usually spend about three years in a school before being moved. Some, as you will have seen, stayed much longer. Some died in service. Women left once they married in early years by choice and or convention. By the 1930s, it was legislated that women must resign when they married. There was actually an act that compelled that and it wasn't repealed until 1947. Male teachers, particularly married male teachers, were often favoured and they were requested by the locals. But finding a common, adequate accommodation was sometimes very difficult. This is a photo from, I'd, my guess would be, it's, well, they're all female, all female pupils of the Binaway Public School with the teacher Catherine Doherty. And she started about 1913, so around that sort of time period. As you've seen, they detail the teacher's appointment and what they did. There's some personal information like the date of birth and date and details of marriage. Come back to that. So this is a card for Mabel Hawkins, who did continue teaching after she married. So she started teaching as Mabel Hawkins and you can see that there was a S in the box for S and that's been crossed out and M put in. She was born in 1892, started teaching at Ryleston and then moved to Kuna Barabran in 1911 and resigned in 1913. So it's interesting. Oh, yeah, so taught, married in August and then resigned in December of 1913. Married to Mr. N. P. Hennessy on the 25th of August 1913 by Edward, Reverend Edward Flanagan, Roman Catholic. Arthur Harrington Bradford Broadhurst was head of, in a way, the headmaster between 1947 and 1958, so that's about halfway down this top page. Um, he, towards the end of his career, agreed in writing to serve wherever required, but only got sent to Hornsby, so it's possibly not too bad. Again, details about when and who he married. She was a teacher and they've recorded, so whether they were still paying superannuation, so he's, finished up I think in about the late 1950s but it's recorded that he died in 1962. The teachers cards aren't listed by name but you can pre-order them to view in the reading room using the series number and the teacher's name or doing the same thing through and order a copy through the professions and occupations cards copy service for $25. So that's a wonderfully speedy run through Coonabarabran and Binaway teachers and schools. And I couldn't decide this was a very good one to end on. John McWhirter was indeed the owner of the store and the public house that the Binaway school was moved to be close to. And I noted that there were still McWhirters in Binaway in 1926, I think, working on one of the buildings. So thank you.